the court so loud, but yes, we are recording. Okay. So welcome to ARC 116 on a Wednesday morning in the middle of the quarter. It is the sixth week of the quarter. Um, we're still working on the midterm quiz. That's open. And I'd like uh, as many of you as can get to it to take that midterm quiz. It's 20 questions, multiple choice. And so we'll be working on that. Um, and I need to just get into what I'm going to be talking about today. So let's do this thing. Um, let's see. How am I going to do this? I'm going to do this as a screen share first. So I'm going to come down here to screen share. And I'm looking at the great big display computer screen here in the classroom. And it didn't, it didn't light up for me. So I'm going to hit it again. Come on, screen share. And go to this thing. And we're going to talk a little bit about the PowerPoint presentation. I've got a couple of slides that deals with this. And so, God, I can't see it from this side. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. Um, this is my PowerPoint presentation. Is this my slideshow? I sure hope it is. Okay. So, analogous colors. Okay. And then this might be a good place to start, really, possibly. Um, talking about warm and cool colors, just because this is a slide from our textbook. And if you guys haven't seen this before, this might be a really good place for us to be talking today. Um, but I guess we have a little bit. But anyway, once again, just for the sake of jazz, I've got a cursor up here so I can talk about warm colors on a warm side of the color wheel, um, the yellows, oranges, and reds, all the way to red violet are considered the warm side of the color wheel that relates to things that we would um, emotionally and through experience think of as warm, like fire and sunshine and that stuff. And the cool colors are things that are associated with green grass, ice, water, and cool things that we would associate with those cool colors. Okay, we're not gonna do a warm and cool project necessarily unless we wind up with a week left at the end of the quarter with nothing to do. Right now, I feel like we're scheduled out to the end of the quarter. So um, that is your experience of warm and cool colors. Um, but know that by um, characterizing colors in such a way that also helps us create color relationships, color balances, color harmonies in compositions when we are um, selecting several colors to put into a painting or a design or some kind of thing where we are using color. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I come to this painting by Paul Cezanne. And you're asking, why am I looking at a whole bunch of um, apples? Um, uh, well, Paul Cezanne was one of the post-impressionist painters at the end of the um, 19th century, uh, was painting in the 18, 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, and is one of the painters who is credited with the idea of coming up with color as um, a way of um, creating depth and um, three-dimensionality in a compositional space. Up to that point, since the, it, the, you know, the Italian Renaissance, you know, 400 years earlier, um, artists had been shading and um, tinting. They had been using the addition of white paint to a color and the addition of black paint to a color to create highlights in a composition and to create shading in a composition. And Cezanne, in his later work, threw out the white paint and kind of threw away the black paint off of his palette and was just using color to try to create a sense of 3D imagery in a composition so that vivid colors would tend to advance towards a viewer, especially warm ones, and neutralized colors would tend to recede you know, away from the viewer and cool colors would also recede away from the viewer, thus opening up a three-dimensional space uh, in a painting, in a painting composition. 
And it's kind of fun to play this game where we take a composition that's super simple that we can get ourselves into and then apply some of our um, um, you know, learning objectives to that. And one of those is looking at a tetrad color scheme, a color scheme created by um, choosing four colors off of the color wheel and applying those to a painting. So we've seen this for a little bit. I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. And come on, where are you? No, not that. Where? Well, here's, okay, this is, this is what I wanted to talk about and I'll be showing this today. So color tetrads can be uh, found on the color wheel using two methods, either using a square superimposed over the color wheel or going to a double split complement over the color wheel. And this shows us several things that can happen here. When you've got a square, you've got um, colors at the four corners of the four vertices of the square, okay? And you know, you're always gonna have at least two colors that are warm colors and two colors that are over on the cool side of the, of the wheel. So you've got that kind of balance in the composition, too warm and too cool. You're also gonna have two colors that are higher key colors that um, are you know, lighter, shall we say, they're higher key value colors on the color wheel and going down to two that are deeper values on the color wheel. Uh, in terms of color cast. Um, so that's that gives us a huge range of what we could do with just four colors in terms of finding color balances and color harmonies in a composition to work with. And the same can be true for the double split complement. If your complementary color pair is yellow green up here and red violet down here and we split to the colors adjacent to each of those colors in the complement pair, um, we, get, um, we get red and violet down at the bottom. We got yellow and green, no, yellow and, yeah, that's green, um, up at the top end. And once again, we have higher key values up at the top. We've got deeper key values down at the bottom. We've got at least one pair of warm colors to work with and one pair of cooler colors to work with in the composition. So we've got these wonderful kinds of balances that get set up by using something as simple as the, the color tetrad. And so I'd like to um, assign, I'd like to suggest that we try this as a painting exercise where we're going to be using paint to do this. And so this is, I guess, where I'm going to switch to my overhead cam here. And uh, so I'm gonna stop the share, I'm to figure out how to stop the share. God, I would surely like to have a monitor on my desk again. And I'd come down here to the video so I can go to a video that's my overhead uh, bird's eye desk, desk cam video device right here. And hello, I need to, uh, pin this video so that we can look at this full size in the sh in the context of the class. All righty, we've got lots of participants in the classroom. So having done all that, I'm going to put aside the keyboard for just a second because the keyboard is something that just gets me into trouble. Clean off your desktop so that we can talk about stuff today. Stuff I want to talk about first is a color wheel. And I guess I'm just going to get myself a square. I'm going to just make myself a square really fast. I don't even have a um, uh, I don't have a scissors on my desktop, and I don't even have time or interest in trying to do this. So I'm going to try to do this square thing so that I can try to illustrate the idea of using a square superimposed over the color wheel to find the four sides, um, the four corners of the square to do that. And you can rotate this square any way you want to, to find four equally spaced, you know, colors on the color wheel to use in a composition. And this is what I want you guys to do. You're going to be painting this wonderful, wonderful, um, composition. 
Um, I've been doing this for a number of years now, and it is fun, and that is terrible. So I'm going to try to hold it up here so that I don't have a lot of photographic highlights on it. But this is the still life of, of Paul Cezanne's apples. It's the simplest composition, really, that he's got out there. It's a cute, cute little um, study about seven little apples sitting on a tabletop. And it's just, it's bathed in light. And so we want to look at how light kind of reflects off of objects and reflects back to our eye and what that does to the colors in the composition. And with apples, we have apples that have different colors on the surface of the apple, which is really cool. If you have, you know, heirloom quality apples that are semi-ripe, but not maybe quite totally ripe on the tree, they're going to have areas of yellow and green and they might have reddish areas as they become more ripe. And so that's kind of what we're working with here in terms of these apples that got picked off the tree. They're just kind of arranged in two rows, sitting on a tabletop, and there's just a little bit, there's one source of illumination, one light source, we'll probably call it sunshine, kind of coming in from the um, lower right-hand side of the composition, coming in in this direction. So the light is striking every spherical piece of fruit in about this spot right here. And so if there's going to be a brightest spot on the piece of fruit, it's going to be in this area. And we might be able to find or identify highlights that are on those kind of surfaces that are reflecting back to the viewer's eye, the highlight of the light coming in. And so we'll see highlights kind of centrally located in most of the pieces of the fruit in his original painting. We've also got that light coming in from the same direction and striking the tabletop down here in the foreground, which is giving us this wonderful little pool of warm yellow light in the foreground area of the composition. And as we move back into space, that light tends to dissipate and it tends to get darker in the background. And so in his composition, he's neutralizing that light by mixing complementary colors together. This actually technically is probably from his early to mid career before we really threw away white and black off of his uh, palette. So there's a little bit of black mixed in with some of the colors and a little bit of white mixed in with some of the colors to give us our highlights and to give us some of our shadows. But we're gonna to try to interpret this in his later, um, uh, the, the way that he painted later on, um, which was maybe just with pure full color um, like that. Um, so that's the kind of compositional construct that we're looking at. There's one more piece of this that I wanted to show you guys. And I'm having a little trouble because I'm not quite finding it in my, um, stuff here and oh my gosh um since i'm recording i can't uh, show you it at all so i'm going to just go ahead and do the next thing here so what i've done to try to interpret this is even though we're talking about um paul cezanne who used a brush and used a brush in the appropriate way using actually the business end of a paintbrush uh with the bristles on it I'm going to ask you guys in this project to turn your brush around and paint with the wrong end of the brush. This is based on the work of um, Georges Seurat, which was, who was a contemporary painter. He was one of the post-impressionists mm -hmm. along with Cezanne. And Georges Seurat invented a, a style of painting that's called pointillism. That's all about little um, individual spots of pure color. He painted with little tiny dots of pure color on large canvases and um, um, didn't do any color blending, wet in wet color blending on that canvas. Instead, he was actually just putting dots of pure color next to each other in the compositional space and trying to build shapes and forms kind of based on how um, the viewer's eye would integrate and um, uh, synthesize all of those colors together. And this is really similar to the way that we have um, 
uh, color television and cathode ray tubes and the way that um, the computer monitors are working for us today. We're using a three color system basically um, with a monitor and the monitor um, analyzes and breaks down um, whatever colors in the photograph or in the film that it's playing and really kind of um, builds all, of, all the colors of the rainbow out of just the three basic colors that are available on the, um, on the monitor. Um, you know, magenta, cyan, and, and, uh, magenta, cyan, and yellow um, are the colors that are being used on the computer monitor. And by putting little pixels of you know, each color together and trying to analyze and figure out how much green and how much red and how much yellow are in each one of, you know, are, are in each square inch of a scene. Um, that's how um, color is kind of recreated um, in a realistic way for us to view on a computer monitor or on a television, any, any digital uh, media that we're looking at. So this is where we're kind of getting close to the idea of how to, how to build something that's more of a digital approach to image making. Is, is with uh, dots of pure color. So if I was to bring in the photograph once again and try to figure out how to do this so that it's not glary, and I wanna to try to come up with a good example of this. I've got a stack of student examples right here, which may or may not be all that great. And I'm gonna find one that I painted on because I consider myself to be pretty good. I've been playing with this for a long time. And so actually this is not maybe all that good, but it gives us kind of an idea of how to play this game with four colors. So I, if you can see the four colors in this painting, I gotta put this down, it's just, it's so shiny. Um, the four color analysis of this, the tetrad the, that I'm using here would be red, there are also uh, green dots in this composition, although I'm using fewer green, less green than, than it's possible to use. So I may only have 25% coverage of green or less, maybe 15% coverage of green. I've got a whole bunch of yellow. Yellow dominates the composition. It's in the pool of light down here in the foreground. It's in the center of most of the apples to try to give us a highlight for each um, apple being highlighted. And green and red kind of go around the edges of the apple, especially these areas of the apple that are sort of starting to go into shadow in this crescent shaped shadow over on the side of each apple. Um, so I'm either using you know, a combination of colors over there, which might be predominantly red or predominantly green as in this area of the composition. And um, the other colors that are in here, let's see, um, red, green, yellow, and violet are my four colors that I'm using in this composition. In the background where, you know, it, it appears to be mostly a neutral color in the painting, we have to try to come up with neutral, neutralizing color combinations of colors and have them um, kind of interspersed with each other so that they sort of act like a neutral area. So I've got red and green and yellow and violet dots interspersed with each other up here in the background that are sort of giving me a kind of a neutralized area of the background. And with more of the lower value colors in the background, more violet and a little bit more of the red, it tends to darken it a little bit so that it tends to recede in space. It, it, it's cool, it is neutralized, and it is lower, lower value, in, lower key in value. And so all of those things together tend to make the background recede away from the viewer's eye. And having a lot of warm color, having um, you know probably 80% of yellow in the foreground with just a smattering of the other colors um, where the, um, pool of light uh, starts to dissipate a little bit, gives us a warm uh, glow of, of yellow in the foreground, which kicks it forward, and it tends to advance towards the viewer's eye, 
thus opening up the um, compositional space um, in front of us. So giving the illusion of three-dimensional space and three-dimensional form on a two-dimensional surface. So that in a nutshell is where I'd like to go with this. To actually come up with a four color tetrad that you're going to stick with, and you really do have to stick with it. You have to choose it and then stick with it for the entire painting. This painting will take at least eight hours of painting to do. So this is going to be um, kind of extended over at least a week, if not two weeks of, of painting to try to get this piece done. And it's not gonna look great to begin with. In the early going, it's going to be kind of rough. Um, the dots might be you know, too big or too small or not quite in the right places and stuff, but you can get things roughed out so that it sort of starts to feel like the painting. Um, this is an even perhaps earlier uh, example. The student was doing a really good job in terms of painting with dots, but if they were painting with all orange dots in one area and no interspersing or smattering of other dots, it doesn't really tend to break up the form very much. I mean, we've got orange here and we've got red as a crescent shape kind of starting to come around the, the back side of the apple. But until you can really intersperse the dots and bring some of your orange dots into the red to break up the red just a little bit, bring some of your green dots into the orange and intersperse them, five or 10% just to break up the orange a little bit. This just gets to be a little bit blotchy and it, it's, it tends to lay a little bit flat and doesn't really do much of that three-dimensional thing that we'd like it to do. So this is a nice start. This is about you know one or two hours of painting, but it, that's all it is, is a really just a start of getting going with this kind of project. Um, when we really get cranking on it um, and start to really start to intersperse the dots throughout the painting and bring your violet dots into even the yellow so that there's the occasional yellow dot, it's kind of like, I don't know, freckles. You, know, you just have to have a couple of freckles in there to break things up a little bit. So um, you can kind of see that in something that's predominant. read over here, the Cezanne's painting, um, by this uh, contour line drawing version of it. And then you're going to actually be the one making decisions about where your four colors go and where they predominate and where they become a lot more interspersed and balanced out in the composition. So this is giving us, even if we are not painters, the ability to enter into a, a, you know, a simple painting formally, but a fairly complex painting in terms of color and try to figure out you know, how to apply color to these various shapes and apply color to various areas to get some of this three-dimensional 
um, thing happening you know, in the composition. How do you get round shapes to become three-dimensional so that the forward portion will pop towards the viewer and the shaded portion will wrap around the back of the piece and move away from the viewer? How do we get the foreground element of, of light to advance towards the viewer's eyes? And how do we get the shaded portion in the background to recede away from the viewer's eyes so that the tabletop actually feels like it is tipping forward a little bit and becoming a little bit more three-dimensional. The front edge of the, of the table is, is moving towards the viewer and the rear edge of the table feels like it's receding away and moving away from the viewer's eye. And we can achieve all of those tricks with color, with the idea of working with color and structuring color in our composition. So this is, we're painting. We're not just you know cutting stuff out of magazines anymore, but this is gonna be something that's gonna take a little bit of work. Um, in the classroom, I've got um, all the paints available and they're over by the sink and available for us to work with. For those of you at home, especially those who are not attending class at all this quarter, this is where you're gonna have to you know, get you uh, identify what the four colors of paint that you're gonna work with are, identifying your um, tetrad off of the color wheel, and then making sure that you can buy those four colors in at least the two ounce bottles from Walmart so that you've got the four colors of your tetrad and you're kind of locked into those four colors and then you can start to apply them to this painting now when you're painting sometimes i just like to put one color on the uh, palette at a time because you know um uh acrylic paint tends to dry really fast in air and so if you put all four colors on the palette and you don't really touch one of those colors for like a half hour or something, you'll get to it and that little puddle is already dried up and it's kind of um, you know, depressing and frustrating that way. So like using one color at a time and just using the wrong end of the brush, I would be dipping the wrong end of the brush into the palette to get uh, a, a little bit of, of paint on the, uh, to wet the end of the brush and then coming in here and doing some dots. And you'll usually get six to eight dots off of that paintbrush before you run out of paint. And then you have to re, you know, go back into the puddle again to get the paintbrush wet and then come back in and start, you know, putting dots down. <clears throat> and when you're in a classroom with a whole bunch of people doing that, it's, it sounds a lot like this because people are just applying dots to their composition. And so there's a lot of tapping that happens. But it's a really kind of wonderful experience where you can kind of get lost in the process of just kind of building form and building shape with color. And then eventually building three dimensional, the illusion of three dimensions with color harmonies in the composition, which can be really fun. This is where I need to take a breath because I've been talking for about half an hour and ask anybody within earshot <clears throat> if they'd like to ask a question get some clarification, something like that. Um, for those of you who are playing this game at home, I have printed out 40 copies of this thing on cardstock. So I've got this on a relatively heavyweight cardstock. And I would like to invite you to stop by the art department, stop by um, Eden Hall here, room seven, um, where the class uh, takes place and grab uh, you know, one or two of these things off the pile so that you've got something to paint on. Um, there's a copy of this in coursework for you to download and print out on your home computer. But if you don't have um, a, a card stock at home to print this on, you're gonna be printing it out on regular um, computer paper. And then your computer paper will really start to curl up after you've got some paint on this in the painting process. Mm -hmm which can be really frustrating. The, the only thing I can add is that you can take a piece of computer paper and glue it down to a piece of Bristol board as another support to it to make a more substantial thing to paint on. And then you might be able to paint on this successfully you know, on computer paper. 
but I've got 40, 50 sheets of this uh, printed out on cardstock here in the, in the classroom. So please come on by um, you know, the classroom if you're ever in town shopping or running errands or something. And our doors are open during regular business hours and you can pick up you know, one or two copies of this so that you can paint this at home. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with the new equipment, with the new um, stuff, I have to the, um, change cameras again so that uh, we can see each other in the classroom and online. And so that's the classroom view. And I will join everybody out here in the classroom so that we can talk about stuff together. Are there any questions from the folks who are online or the folks who are in the classroom um, about this project so far? Um, I know, it's like drinking from a fire hose and you can't believe that I'm asking you to do this kind of thing. Hey, have a piece of paper. So I've got the, uh, the black and white printouts for this thing and I'm gonna make them available to everybody so that we can get this party started. Um, this is printed out on a very, as heavy a cardstock as is available um, for, for printing, for sending through a copy machine or printer. And so this is the concept. I'm gonna try to choose a um, four color tetrad. Um, that's a legit tetrad, you know, either a standard tetrad or the double split complement tetrad. And then you must um, kind of uh, restrict yourself to just using those four colors for this particular painting and composition. And I don't know what else to tell you. It's, it's very strange to be um, presenting like to the online um, audience and the in-person audience. And everybody is kind of just a little bit um, uh, either bored out of their minds or overwhelmed with the idea of this project. So are there any questions or comments from anybody? If you're online, don't hesitate to unmute your mic and fire away that question if you have one. I guess, you know, it, it's looking like it's a pretty standard uh, next project. This thing for me usually takes about two weeks. It almost does take six class periods to try to get this project done because it takes one or two class periods just to sort, to sort of get up to speed with this and understand the process and to try to get your feet wet um, in terms of selecting the four colors for your tetrad and then starting a painting process and getting sort of comfortable with the idea of putting dots down on the page to get this thing started. Um, on Friday, I'm gonna go ahead and, and do a demonstration of all of this. I hope that by Friday, you guys can get in here and either get some copies of this thing so that you've got copies or get them printed out so that you've got a version of this at home that you can do too and get your paint and paintbrushes together. We've got a ton of paint in the classroom and paintbrushes in case you can come to the classroom and paint this thing. Um, the the um, uh, pandemic seems to be waning uh, quite a bit. Um, rates of infection are going down. Um, it looks like this thing might be nearing its and or the end might possibly be in sight with the possible exception of another you know, variant um, coming on. So hopefully there is less risk for you guys and uh, you, know, you can be in the classroom, uh, perhaps painting on this with more of a, a, a feeling of safety and security, um, if that helps any at all for the folks who are online. Yes, okay. Um, Probably a bone here. Oh, hi. <laughs> I do see people uh, making eye contact in the classroom, so that's a good sign. Um, this is the next project. We're going to get this party started definitely on Friday with a big demonstration by me and get everybody yeah, in the classroom painting. So try to get yourself uh, some materials and get ready to do this with us on Friday if you're online and we'll get this going then. 
Okay, that's 45 minutes of presentation. I think I'm going to wrap it up here. If I don't see any other questions from either um, audience. Uh, thank you guys. There they go. I'm going to hit the um, end button and see you guys on Friday. And, uh,